Hello world, for years the Google Translate desktop app has secretly been mining Monero on people's computers. Except Google Translate doesn't have a desktop app, so if you have this on your PC, it's probably malware. So hackers have been taking advantage of the surprisingly large amount of search traffic for a Google Translate desktop version. Google Trends doesn't give actual search volume numbers, but if we compare it to another search term, we can see similar amounts of people have been searching for how much RAM do I need? I think that puts into perspective the sheer scale of the search volume. And given there's little competition for this traffic, if any, since a desktop version of Google Translate simply doesn't exist, the miscreants have been able to rank pretty highly in Google search. And their website shows they've been taking advantage of searches for other things like Microsoft Translator Desktop and PC Auto Shutdown, whatever that is. And I'll never cease to be amazed by just how sloppy these kinds of malware spreading websites can be. In the customer testimonial section, they've accidentally pasted the same fake testimonial twice. Once downloaded, the EXE does actually do what it says on the tin. It gives you Google Translate. It turns out the bad actors have embedded the actual Google Translate web page into their EXE using the Chromium framework, which is quite easy to do just by following tutorials. And here we get to the clever bit, because this Translate app doesn't do the crypto mining itself. Instead, it drops a separate executable, which then drops another EXE, and then another, with each new executable cleaning the trail left behind it. On top of that, a whole load of delays programmed into this process cause it to take weeks. So by the time the actual crypto miner starts working, the victim might have even just deleted the initial translator app and forgotten all about it. By the time the crypto miner is discovered, if at all, you have no idea where it came from. This has allowed this campaign, which is being called NitroCod, to go undetected for years. It's only now being exposed in a report by Checkpoint. And shortly after the report was released, the miscreants wiped their domain, scurrying away into the abyss. Next up, there are reports of a massive TikTok hack. The hackers claim to have accessed almost a terabyte of data and information on 2 billion users. The group responsible tweeted, Who would have thought that TikTok would decide to store all their internal backend source code on one Alibaba cloud instance using a trashy password? As is becoming tradition, it seems, details of the leak were posted on breach forums, but in the achievements section rather than the leaks market, suggesting that the hackers behind this aren't in it for financial gain. But we'll get to their motive shortly. The leak hasn't been posted in full, but the hackers published roughly 100 megabytes of it as proof, which I of course downloaded. So one of the files contains a single TikTok user's entire list of videos. And I'm not blurring anything here because this is actually all public information. The problem with verifying this kind of proof is that you don't know whether it actually came straight from TikTok's database or if it's just been scraped from public sources. And scraped databases of TikTok videos have been floating around for a while. There's, there's nothing special about them. In another leaked file, we have what looks to be a sample of PayPal transactions from the TikTok shop. Okay, so this data definitely can't be scraped from public sources, but all the transactions are from a John Doe who lives on one main street. This screams test data, i.e. data used to test TikTok's backend and not actual real user data. And based on those email addresses, I'd say, yep, that's about right. There's a bunch of other files in the sample, but they either comprise of empty tables or yet more sample data. So far, I have to admit, this leak seems like nothing more than just a grab for internet points. TikTok themselves responded to the hacker's tweet saying, Our security team investigated these claims and found no evidence of a security breach. At a guess, I would say there has been a breach of some kind, but it's insignificant and has been wildly misrepresented for the sake of those juicy internet points. The group behind this drama is called Against the West, and their name does need some explaining. So this is a pro-Western group. They chose their name so that after they had hacked someone, they could say, we hacked you because you're against the West. Hopefully that clears that up. Though a confusing choice of name, IMO. I was actually in this group's Telegram channel way back when the invasion of Ukraine had just kicked off. At the time, Against the West was very active. But from what I saw, these guys have a history of making big claims which rarely amount to much. For example, on one occasion they claimed to have infiltrated the Central Bank of Russia, but the only proof was this single screenshot of some random directory. I did interview Against the West a few months ago, but I just never made a video on it because I couldn't verify a lot of what they said, and before I could arrange a second interview, their main guy, who was my contact within the group, apparently died of brain cancer. 
which at the time I was very skeptical of, because when I spoke to the guy literally a couple days before his apparent demise, he was 100% cognitively fine. Brain cancer is meant to cause a whole load of cognitive impairments, especially in someone's final days, so I can only presume this was some kind of an excuse to disappear, or at least give the illusion of disappearing, perhaps to pop up under a different identity. As for this latest hack, if we can even call it that at this point, after receiving a lot of hate for the worthless samples, they deleted their post on breach forums and were subsequently given a two-week ban for lying about data breaches, which was then made permanent. They were also banned on Twitter, and something tells me this might be the last we'll hear of against the West. Next up, in what looks like some kind of a physical DDoS attack, there has been a mysterious traffic jam in central Moscow caused by taxis. It seems that someone, somehow, exploited the Yandex taxi app to send dozens of taxis to one single spot in Moscow, bringing traffic to a standstill. The Yandex taxi app is like Russian Uber. If you need to get around and are too lazy to use public transport, this is the app you use. As per the clue in the name, this app is run by Yandex, Russia's largest tech company. Of course, when there's some kind of a hack targeting anything Russian, people automatically assume it must be some kind of hacktivism. And there are a few reasons why hacktivists would want to go after Yandex. Firstly, it's a large tech company, and it's Russian, two things hacktivists tend not to like. Also, Yandex's CEO was sanctioned by the EU after Yandex's search engine was accused of bias and removing content critical of the Kremlin. However, there's no real evidence that this was done by hacktivists. Some anonymous related Twitter accounts have reposted the video and claimed responsibility, but these Twitter accounts don't launch attacks of their own, and rather just claim they're responsible for any act of cyber sabotage against anything and everything Russian. No one has posted proof that they were behind the traffic jam. As for how this traffic jam was caused in the first place, well, that's still a bit of a mystery. Someone might have created a bunch of bots to request taxis, or maybe they used stolen Yandex accounts, or perhaps there was some kind of vulnerability in the taxi app itself. Either way, the hack, if we can call it that, didn't have a massive effect. It did bring the area to a standstill for about an hour, and Yandex will have to compensate all those drivers for wasting their time. This video was made possible by Linode, who are giving you a $100 60-day credit just for signing up. Linode is essentially your Swiss army knife for cloud computing. If it runs on Linux, it'll run on Linode. One great feature of Linode is their app marketplace, which makes it super easy to spin up servers with pre-configured software. Use Linode's Kali Linux app to quickly spin up a fresh instance of Kali. The installer makes it easy to configure the basics, like VNC passwords, whether you want a desktop environment, and so on. Linode can run almost anything by providing all the tools a developer really needs at competitive prices. Use the link in the description now to claim your free $100. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Have a good one.